Uh, I'm sure you will acknowledge that 2020 has really exhausted us all. I will admit that I have had to dive through um, really to the depths of my soul to find the power to keep going and to keep others going. I've tried hard not to make promises about a future I, I don't control while also you know, being positive about what the future has the potential to hold. I am a black woman attempting to lift my people even as I am burdened with the same affliction, this brown skin. I often find myself wondering how does the doctor suffering with stage four diagnosis inspire the patient who believes the disease will kill them? That is what this country is requiring of black leadership. Um, and to be clear, that is what this city is requiring of black leadership. Back in July of 2019, when our fiscal year started, the Urban League, we were just dealing with regular old racism and you know other things that were happening in the community we serve. And you know, I say that, and then that's really not true because honestly, um, the president is. This is really. It hasn't been regular old racism for a long time, actually. And that's really not a comment about Democrats or Republicans. It's just about harmful, deadly, poisonous policy, creating the antithesis of a world designed to keep my children safe. Um, but anyway, way back then, before there was any pandemic that we were aware of, the league was on track for a record year. Job placements were higher than ever. Housing counseling was at an all time high. Black home ownership was being moved forward by our work and we were doing enough expungements to clog the courthouse. We then began hearing about this virus and we, we took precautions, but eventually it was clear that we had to get most of the staff and all of our clients out of the building until we could figure out a safer way. On March 13th, 2020, everybody went home and there were three of us left in the building. We walked through our finances, trying to figure out what we could do, how we could do it, how long we would be able to continue to serve um, if this virus continued to impact the world, you know, indefinitely. And as we sat, in that office on March 13th, 2020, just trying to figure out how to manage this new world, I got a call from LMPD informing me that there had been an officer involved shooting. I will never forget that call because I was honestly, I felt like I was in the middle of my own crisis. Um, I asked if I could go down to the police station to see the body camera footage, and I was told that there was none. That did surprise me because actually I thought there was a new rule that all officers would use body cameras. And when I brought that up, I was told that there was, there was an exception for these particular um, types of officers. That did not make sense to me because even an undercover officer serving a warrant, um, you know, your cover would be blown once you serve the warrant. So I really couldn't understand why there wasn't body camera footage. And I mean, I was pretty sure that the community was under the impression that body cameras were standard for all officers. I guess we failed to read the fine print. But anyway, on March 13th, when I hung up the phone, I was deflated. A young black woman was dead. There was no body camera footage. And all I could think of was how would the city respond? I mean, the people of the city, the residents, me. I left the phone call believing the drugs and money were found and those things were found, but they were not found in the home of the woman who had been killed. And we all know now, but I learned on that day, her name was Brianna Taylor. At some point, I spoke with Eddie Woods and Eddie runs a violence prevention program here in the city we expressed our concerns to one another about the case. We both had the sense that this case would be different. There would be, there just, it didn't make sense. I called back LMPD repeatedly with questions. 
but um, there was a pandemic. I had a lot on my mind. There was a lot going on. So we continued watching and waiting and asking questions. <clears throat> At some point, I, I really did feel that the answers were not so much evasive as they were dishonest. And I said as much. And my question to the individual responding to my concerns was, you know, are you lying to me or is it possible that they are lying to you? Even as I asked those questions, I was consumed with my own burdens trying to run the Urban League, ensuring that our clients and our staff had what they needed and that our doors remained open, but that everyone was safe. I mean, we did not close. We changed our hours, but we never stopped serving the community because after all, this is the time that they need us the most. And it was also in March that we realized that construction for the sports and learning complex was in danger of being completely shut down. We needed cash immediately to be able to move forward. I called advisors. And to a person, they all said, Sadiqwa, you will work it out. I felt like they had faith in me that I did not deserve. And honestly, I didn't want. And it was at that point that Humana Inc. stepped in and saved the day. They agreed to invest in the project immediately. Crisis averted. All of a sudden, the 300 plus jobs we had created were safe we would move forward. I was beginning to breathe normally. <laughs> as normally as you can, as a black woman leading a civil rights organization in a pandemic where you were worried about the facts of a case where police have killed a black woman and you feel like you're not getting straight answers. So one crisis was averted, but the pressure was still there. And then on May 5th, we learned that 25 year old Ahmaud Arbery had been shot to death in Georgia. That case had been brushed under the rug for months, but gained traction. And we all watched in horror as the facts came out. The prosecutor had recused herself because one of the men involved in the shooting was a retired officer who had been an investigator in her office. A second prosecutor recused themselves. And just in case you're keeping score, uh, two prosecutorial bodies recused themselves in the Breonna Taylor case as well, the Commonwealth Attorney and the U.S. Attorney for the Western District of Kentucky. Anyway, um, we were dealing with a pandemic, trying to feed people who had no source of income and were on the phone for hours and days and weeks trying to get through to unemployment. We were trying to um, secure supplies for those we served, trying to pay rent, trying to figure out transportation in cases where taxis or Uber and Lyft would not come, did not have enough drivers. Um, it, was, it was a tough time. But we all watched the Ahmaud Arbery case with the rest of the country. We heard them lie about the fact that there had been so many burglaries in that community. We heard them lie about who he was and what he was up to. And then we saw the video. And all I could think was about a mother losing her son. And then the people who killed him rewriting the story of who he was, implying that he was not worthy of living. After we are killed, our stories are stolen. Kind of like the history books, just rewritten. So on May 25th, as Louisville is questioning Brianna's case and learning about Ahmaud Arbery, a police officer kneels on the neck of George Floyd. It was the slow, quiet, easy way 
he was killed. I don't know how police departments retrain men who would slowly kill a man for allegedly passing a fake $20 bill. How do you train someone to see the humanity in another human being? Now, some people think it was the George Floyd case that really broke the dam in Louisville, but that's not accurate. It was not May 25th, but instead it was the day that the Pulitzer Prize winning Courier Journal released the 911 recording. It was May 28th. All fears about the Breonna Taylor case were confirmed. The recording confirmed what he said. He didn't know they were police. The audio confirmed what we suspected. The case against Kenny, it wasn't strong. After all, what black man is released on home incarceration after shooting a white police officer? We knew there was more to that story. The audio confirmed for us that police immediately had access to information that contradicted the story, the story they called and told me on March 13th, the day I sent all of my employees home, the day I was trying to figure out how to keep the league doors open, the day I was trying to figure out how to serve this community the police called me and lied. It was not open and shut. What we heard in Kenny's 911 call, that is what sent Louisvillians out of their houses and into the streets. Uh, we were devastated by Ahmaud's murder. We were traumatized by George Floyd's murder, but it was Breonna Taylor's life and death that ravished any semblance of trust we had in our city leaders. And so on May 28th, I walked down Main Street into a crowd of protesters and officers in riot gear. It was the first time in my life I heard tear gas being detonated. For some reason, I did not imagine that pepper bullets would be used on nonviolent protesters. Unless you were out there, you do not know the impact of realizing in your own American city, nonviolent protesters were being met with riot gear, tear gas, and pepper bullets. And on that night, after seeing those things, I heard gunfire. I stood at the corner of 3rd and Jefferson debating whether to move forward. And suddenly there was a man laying on the ground. He'd been shot by someone. In fact, seven people were shot that night. This city was not one that I recognized. We still don't know who fired the weapons that night. The police say they didn't do it. As much as I wanted to stop the rage, I recognized that the rage was righteous and the system did need to be disrupted. We begged city officials to fire the officers. We warned city officials not to underestimate the stamina of the community. We failed. And um, as if we weren't <laughs> already in enough pain, in the early morning hours of June 1st, a black man in the West End was killed by law enforcement. The National Guard and LMPD had gone down to 26th and Broadway. There were no protesters there, but apparently there were people in violation of a curfew, a curfew they probably didn't even know existed. I asked if there were body cameras. The answers were confusing. They remain. Black leaders across this community braced ourselves for a terrible day. I prayed, I'm sure a lot of people did. By 7.28 a.m., I had had at least three phone calls about the death of David McAtee. I also, <laughs> as a side note, sent a text message to Pat Matheson at 6.28 a.m. asking her if she could please attend a funeral and sing at 12 o'clock that day. She said yes. The song was Amazing Grace. I kissed my kids goodbye and I went to work. 
and Stefan Dingle from WLKY came to the Louisville Urban League and asked for an interview. And when we finished, he told me that David McAtee's body was still laying there. I jumped in my car, drove down Broadway, and I saw a community in mourning, my community. On one side of the street, people were enraged. On the other side of the street, officers in riot gear, some in regular uniform. I felt like I was pulling up to a wildfire with a bottle of water. <laughs> I mean, just, just for a moment, imagine this man that was beloved by his community, a man who would feed protester and police had been killed at the hands of law enforcement. And the people now standing guard at the scene, causing his body to remain there for hours and hours were the very people who killed him. And the community that loved him had to stand across the street in the heat and do nothing. And I imagine that some of you all are thinking now, well, he fired a weapon and I understand that you're thinking that. But I also hope you are wondering, when was it that our police department started shooting pepper bullets at citizens in violation of a curfew? I hope you're wondering, would they do that in prospect? But on that day, there were so many there. Uh, Hannah, Tanya, Katura, Pastor Williams, Kelsey, Pastor Finley, Emmanuel, people I knew, people I didn't know, people whose faces I knew and didn't know names. And for a little while, I was sure that someone or many people would be killed. The energy was stressful. I couldn't imagine that we would all survive, to be honest. Our community was in pain in rage and police were offended and afraid and they looked like they were ready for war. Occasionally one of us would walk across the street just to talk with police. We couldn't imagine how they would move David McAtee without someone else being hurt or killed. The crowd was too angry. All I could do is pray for direction. And then Pat Matheson sent a text to let me know that the funeral was over. She will tell you that I returned her text with a phone call, speaking erratically and yelling for her to meet me, meet me, meet me on Broadway. And I walked over to the officer who seemed to be in charge and asked him if he could please give us a sign before they move the body. Recognizing the volatility of the situation, he agreed. And when he signaled, we put Pat on the bullhorn and she sang Amazing Grace. The tears poured and I would be lying if I didn't acknowledge those who were frustrated and tired of being pacified by old Negro spirituals and gospel songs. But for many of us, we were just trying to find a way to live through that day and we saw no alternative. Ultimately, we were able to release the air we'd been holding in for hours. I saw a man physically fall down from the stress. For me, I got in my car and what should have been a 15 minute ride took an hour and a half because I just kept pulling over to process. I run a civil rights organization. I know racism is alive and well, but from my point of view, having been born in 1972, Black Louisvillians and Black Americans were experiencing a level of trauma that was unprecedented for me for my lifetime. As you know by now, every time we thought we'd get justice, it never came. The Attorney General came to the league. He met with a group of us. Pastor Finley, Pastor Williams were among the group. He told us he would be fair. We specifically asked about the affidavit for the warrant. He told us he would look at the entire case. And then he walked out and at some point between that day and the day he stood at the podium and explained to us just how little 
our lives mattered. Can you imagine a 26 year old white female first responder being killed in her home at the hands of police and months later, there is still no investigating authority willing to confirm that the affidavit used to secure the warrant was even valid. I think white people would have burned Louisville down. We have evidence that this city and this country knows what justice looks like because it is afforded to others. In every way, shape and form, the black community has and continues to be failed. And now in Louisville, there are weekly meetings about how to stop the bleeding. It is long past time for Louisville's leadership to stop the smoke and mirrors. Past time for lofty rhetoric with little in the way of real change. My cries and those of many others have largely gone unheeded. We get invited to the meetings, but even when it comes to our community, people don't listen. No more. And not because of who I am or anything specific that I or the league has done, but because this city in its apathy toward our humanity has awoken a new wave of freedom fighters and reinvigorated some old ones. And we will never again have peace without justice. We will not settle and we will not stop until the fight is finished. America in its tattered history does have one brief moment when it legitimately attempted to do right by black people and correct racial wrongs. And we all know that time is reconstruction. Reconstruction is a time when real equity policies were implemented. Black representatives were installed at state and federal levels. Land was deeded over to former slaves and the federal government committed to hold it all together, placing federal troops all across the South. But that period ended because in 1876, following a contentious election, the Republican party, mostly Northerners who had fought and won the Civil War, sought to make peace and unity with Southerners threatening again to disrupt and divide the Union. Rather than risk fighting another war, they opted to compromise, maintaining their white power and sacrificing the rights and lives of black people. This nation and more specifically this city is at a similar point in its history. This is our reconstruction opportunity, but we have to be willing to fight this war and do what it takes to win. We must win the war against racism, win the war against disenfranchisement, win the war against political complacency and corporate neglect. We must be willing to fight and win the war for humanity and dignity for all people. That will require us to be unwavering in our commitment to hold the line. We cannot compromise our principles. We cannot be willing to sacrifice anyone's humanity ever again. It is time for those with power and privilege to develop some backbone. The people in the streets have theirs. You have to be prepared to sit with your discomfort to admit the wrongs of our city leaders, some of your corporations. You have to be willing to help us move forward. We can be the best city in the country. How can you not be inspired to change when you see the diverse groups of young and old people raising their fists together and their voices for justice? How can you not be inspired by some of these corporations that are stepping up to say, we are really going to put our money where our mouth is I know you didn't love the Derby protest, but didn't you respect the idea that people who were sick and tired of being sick and tired still had the wherewithal to organize a nonviolent demonstration of their pain? What would you do if your children were being killed? We know our community is not perfect and I'm tired of hearing that, but we are no less human. And we have done nothing to ourselves or to anyone else that is not also recorded in the true history of white Americans. We were not responsible for creating slavery or Jim Crow or redlining. 
So stop allowing people to tell us how bad we are. Help us fix the policies that break our backs. Community leaders came together and gave you a path forward. Read it. And I am sorry, I know for many of you, this is not the speech you wanted and it was my intention to inspire you. But instead I have decided I wanted to provoke you to action. We have answers. Listen to us. Consider the number of black people in leadership in your company. Consider the number of black board members on your board. Consider the number of loans you underwrite for black businesses. Consider who it is you decide to give the benefit of the doubt. I am here in this city because I love it. Don't ever doubt that about me. But we must be intentional about the work, not the ribbon cuttings and the meetings, but the work. So if you wanna know how I'm feeling, I'm feeling inspired by the alignments I've seen. I'm feeling hopeful because of the conversations I'm hearing, but do the work. Do not waste this crisis. Learn and help us move forward. You matter to me and I believe that I matter to you, but does the little black girl in the hood with no law degree matter too? If she does, build her affordable housing, help her close the achievement gap. Speak up for her. Louisville, I believe we are forever changed, but only you can decide what we will be changed into. In spite of it all, I feel optimistic. So <laughs> like I told Russ Cox when I called him that day, answer my call. Thank you for everything you have done and for recognizing the things that have been left undone. We can be better, we will be better, but we must sit with the truth of our failure. That is the only way for us to get to justice. Thank you.